Hey, good afternoon, guys. I hope um, I am able to keep you awake towards the late evening time. Um, so instead of going into a, like a deep technical dive on RocksDB, I am here to tell you a story, like the story of uh, why we decided to do RocksDB and what is RocksDB. So uh, how many of you have worked with like or played around with key value stores earlier? So yeah, so almost everybody is familiar with key value stores. So in my presentation, sometimes I refer to it as a database, sometimes the key value store kind of used interchangeably here. Mm. And uh, the story is mostly about um, why yet another key value store. Uh, there are plenty of key value stores out there. You would have used Cassandra, HBase, MongoDB, CouchDB. You can use each of these things as a key value store too. Uh, but then why did we decide to build yet another, another one? Um, and what are the challenges that we had to kind of uh, go over before we could make it uh, usable for some of our applications? So that's the story that I want to tell. Uh, again, the whole, um, this project is actually done by like a team of people. I'm just the front end. It's not just my work. So the database engineering team is the one that's mostly working on this. So uh, everybody, use, most likely everybody uses Facebook. So this is a Facebook page. There are a lot of uh, applications running on this, on this Facebook page. Um, th there is the newsfeed application, which is right in the middle. Then there is some advertisements that are happening on there. There are people you may know that that will happen. That is, that's an application that is powering this page. Then there is chat, which is not showing up actually here, which is another application. So there are many applications inside Facebook. So RocksDB is something that we wanted to build so that we can use it for most of these applications are a wide variety of applications. It's not like customized for one application as such, right? Um, now, when you try to build an application which, um, which works for many different, when you build an infrastructure for different applications, um, one way to organize your application architecture is like the traditional uh, style where you have a database server, you have an application server, and you have a network in the middle. Uh, and the database server is most likely or maybe serving data from disks, right? So this application architecture is a client-server model, which most of us are familiar with. Um, and you'd see, again, the numbers that I put are mostly relative numbers. Please don't take the numbers as like cast in stone. I just wanted to put the numbers so that I can give a relative perspective of the network speeds and the disk speeds, right? So networks like, say, a few micros or maybe 50 to 100 microseconds maybe. Um, and then late disk latency is 10 milliseconds. So this is so if you have an application which is running on an application server, the network overhead is relatively very small because most of the accesses are most of the time you are spending accessing data from your disk, right? So this works very well when there are disks uh, on the on the database servers. Now what happens if instead of disks you have SSD or RAM? Let's say your database is purely on SSDs, right? Uh, or your database is purely on RAM. Again, these numbers that I put, 100 microseconds for SSD and 100 nanoseconds for RAM, they're just to give you a perspective of relativeness with the network. Again, you'll have different numbers based on your hardware, right? So here you would see that if it's a network, here the network is 50 microseconds, and SSDs and RAMs are kind of close to, RAM is much faster, but SSDs are kind of close to what the network speed is. So if you do a network access, if your application is doing a network access, half of the time of the latency is actually spent on the network. So maybe at this time, it's obviously you would need to get a faster network. That's one solution to kind of um, make your applications run faster. Uh, but yet another architecture would be to somehow uh, remove those, um, the, 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 the database server and the network completely from this picture. And uh, do move those the storage directly into the application server. So this is what I mean by an embedded application architecture. And this is the reason why I think there will be some applications uh, who, because of, because of the requirement to get fast latencies or low latencies from very fast storage, they need to get to this architecture. So RocksDB is built assuming that um, there will be some applications who need this architecture. Again, this architecture is not a general purpose saying that it will work for all of your applications. So you'd have to decide for yourself what application you need, uh, what, which of your application fits these, this model. But my belief is that there'll be some applications which will benefit if you go to this model where the database is part of the application server. So now if the database is part of the application server, 
we still need some generic code in the database so that we can, uh, when you make optimizations to the database, all of your applications can benefit at the same time, right? So that is what I meant by this database server code actually living inside the application server but having its own life of its own. So you'll have specific APIs to access the database. Uh, so now going back, now going back to the story um, of uh, of the case where storage is directly attached to disk, we said that hey, there are um, different solutions that we could use for this kind of architecture. We could use some open source software that's out there. Um, most likely, say you can think about uh, like Berkeley DB, SQLite, Kyoto 3DB, Level DB. These are open source databases that are out there. Uh, anybody out here who who hasn't played around with at least one of these? Okay, so maybe I see like maybe less than a percent. Most people are familiar with at least one of these because Berkeley DB has been around for a long, long time. And it's one pretty popular embedded database or key value store. Um, so, so for our choices, our choice was to use one of these and see if it meets our needs, right? And the other choice is that we already had a bunch of applications inside Facebook who were kind of developed with this embedded architecture in mode. That's what I meant by the FB proprietary ones. Uh, they had good features, like there, some of them were really high performant because that's what it is built for. Uh, but then there are some limitations from some of the previous generation FB proprietary software, which had like, say, for example, some of them did not have transaction log. And they were built with like fixed key sizes, so we could not use it easily for different applications inside Facebook. Um, so uh, we looked at, um, so, so we looked at the existing ones that are out there and said that which one should we start using for this new breed of applications, which are embedded applications. So we took a look at open source benchmarks that are already done out there. And you'd see that um, the most difficult benchmarks for a database are like random reads and random writes. I mean, that basically establishes the limit of your database software, right? It might not be what your application is needing, but it tells you how flexible your database is so that if you put enough load, it'll like be within that limit. So our two benchmarks, the first two benchmarks that we tried to figure out or use to evaluate are random reads and random writes. And we looked at um, open source data, which already showed some of these results. These are results that I took from the LevelDB uh, benchmark page. Um, LevelDB is an open source benchmark that does LSM. And they have uh, benchmarked LevelDB, Coyote 3DB, and SQLite for random reads and random writes. Um, again, uh, these numbers will vary, obviously, based on your CPUs, your memory, or your storage that you are using. Uh, but the takeaway from this benchmark results, we, I actually repeated these benchmarks on one of my machines. And I saw very uh, similar numbers for LevelDB that's presented here. Um, so the takeaway for us was that LevelDB was pretty good in uh, random reads, uh, and it was really awesome in random writes. The reason being is that it's an LSM engine, so you write, writes all are like uh, appending writes to the storage. Uh, we also looked at um, we also looked at like other uh, LSM engines that we have inside of Facebook, like HBase. Uh, I actually worked on HBase for 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 a year, for a couple of years, but then it was very difficult for me to take the um, HBase and make it like an embedded library, because it's HBase is like a bigger system, which is distribution and uh, failover and everything is tied up into it. Um, so we said that we also looked at some of the code pieces for these uh, databases, and we saw that the LevelDB code was really well written and well organized. If you look at the code, it'll probably take you half hour to kind of read up all the APIs and start using it. Um, the code is very well structured, and it was um, written with good documentation out there, saying that this is how you should be using the APIs in LevelDB. So um, I was very inclined to start working on LevelDB and saying that maybe I can take LevelDB and make it work for our application especially because random writes are pretty high on this storage system. Uh, so we took level, so I took level DB and then we said that, um, like why, why are random writes so, so good in level DB, right? So the main reason is because it is a log structured merge architecture. Um, and then what it does, it write, write requests from the application comes to memory, a piece of memory, and it also goes to a transaction log. And then when enough data accumulates in memory, it goes to like files in, in your flash device or in your disk device. Um, so that's where, that's, that's kind of the basic architecture of LevelDB. This is again open source I'm talking about now. 
Um, and then there's a compaction process that runs once a while and merges these files. And then when a read request comes in, you go look at your data on, in RAM and the data uh, on the disk, and that's how you serve your uh, read requests from your application. So this is traditional LSM-style architecture, which is level DB implements. So that's the reason why writes are very fast. So we said that, okay, let's use this. Now we understand the code very well. We understand the architecture very well. Um, the code was um, maybe like 15,000 lines of code at that time. Um, and then we said that let us try to see benchmark it for some of our applications that we have. So we took our first application, mm -hmm. and then we started to run uh, like stock level DB from open source and see how it works. So very soon we ran into a problem where um, where uh, the write rates were not high enough. So we are seeing like two or three megabyte writes per second on a machine which could potentially do much more. And the reason was because there was not enough concurrency in the, system, in, in the, in the database software code to be able to keep all the CPUs busy. So this is a problem that has also been kind of listed in open source. So I was not surprised to see this problem the first time when I started to use it. Um, but the fix was not that simple. The fix was actually to um, do multi-threaded compaction. So there is a compaction process that I explained earlier. Uh, the compaction process, we change stuff in the compaction process now where you could actually use multi-threaded compaction. So what happens is that um, the write rates like increase by like nine to 10 times based on the ability of the software now to be able to keep all the CPUs busy uh, to be compacting fast. So in an LSM database, uh, the amount of data you can write is actually directly proportional to how fast you can compact, right? Otherwise, you just run out of disk space, so then you don't have a stable system. So compaction is really important to be able to ingest data fast. Um, so this is the first um, thing that we did, and I thought that, oh, maybe this is like a um, person going to a dentist for the first time and getting a teeth pulled out, and he's gone back home very happy, you know, application will run very well. So application ran for some time with this fix, um, very soon we saw that um, latencies uh, started to spike, especially when the size of the data started to grow more and more. Uh, the latencies started to spike, P99 latencies are what mostly we are interested in. P50 is usually pretty good, but P99 is starting to spike to like 10 seconds or like nine seconds once a while, right? So mm, there are a lot of problems. Again, LevelDB's architecture was not designed for the server workload in my mind. So that's the reason why we are facing these problems. It's not because the LevelDB code is bad. It's just because the workload that you're putting is the server workload, which is like keep 24 CPUs busy with like three terabytes of flash. So that's a, like a pretty strong workload. So we saw that uh, single-threaded flushes and then flushes were comp conflicting with compaction, and so we're not able to uh, get, uh, like, what is it called? Um, uh, very consistent latencies for the writes or the reads also. So we implement like thread aware compaction. So we actually have different thread pools to be able to do things differently. We also have like um, mem tables where you have multiple mem tables in memory so that when some mem tables are getting flushed to the storage, you can continue to write to other mem tables in memory. Um, so we were able to reduce these P99 latencies almost 10 times based on what stock level DB is. Um, so at this point, we changed quite a bit of code because like I said, we changed the compaction process and then uh, we changed latencies. Um, at this, uh, again, uh, we, we started running the application more and I thought, okay, now we are good. For the first application, this is what we go, need to do. But uh, that is not the end of the story. Now when the database became larger in size, like say, um, 60 gig or 100 gig database now I'm talking about. This is basically we're running this for longer periods of time. Um, we saw that there is something called write amplification, which is that every byte you write to the database, how many times it needs to be rewritten so that it's compacted and defragmented and stuff like that, right? So level DB uh, by design has a very high uh, write amplification factor because there are certain levels that you have, the data has to go through before it can be like fully compacted. For example, uh, maybe I have an example here to show you. Uh, so this is the level style compaction in level DB. So level zero, level one, level two, there are actually seven levels in level DB, but here I'm just talking about three levels. So what happens, the file, these are sizes of files. So when you need to compact these files, uh, this file gets compacted into a six byte file and becomes 11 bytes, and then there's a second stage of compaction which results in the 10 bytes. Here I'm assuming that your database is fixed size of, or has reached a constant size of 10 bytes, 
right? So it basically needs two levels of compaction before your data gets into the lowest level. So this causes, so if you see that if there's seven levels and your multiplication factor is 10, then you'd have like a right amplification of 70. Um, so if, if, so very likely you will be like bottlenecked by the disk throughput or the flash throughput because the flash, although it has high IOPS, the throughput is still like say maybe 500 megabytes per second or something. Uh, so we ran into that problem. And so we said that, hey, this compaction algorithm, the level style compaction algorithm might not be the best one for our application. We need to write a different style of um, compaction algorithm. So we kind of uh, uh, implemented universal style compaction. So universal style compaction borrows some of the ideas from HBase, the way HBase does compaction. It also borrows some ideas from our proprietary software that we used to run earlier. Um, there's a complicated kind of, not complicated, but more um, detailed mathematical formula of how to pick files in this compaction logic. So I won't go into the detail, but it's in, our, it's in the code and also in the web. So you can, I can point you to those. Um, so essentially the idea here is again, if you have three files, you could, instead of compacting level by level, you could potentially, based on some mathematical formula, figure out when best to compact it into a file at one in one shot. So basically reduce write amplification. Um, and uh, this, reduced, this, this technique of universal style compaction reduced write amplification to less than 10. Um, so by this time, we have changed like lots of code in LevelDB. So uh, we were wondering that uh, we rewrote everything. So maybe that's, that's the end of the story and we are good to go. But again, we, we're running for some more time now and reads are starting to become a problem. Because uh, we solved writes, we solved the write throughput problem. In P99 problems we solved, but now we have a problem with reads. Uh, so, secondary, so this is an application like secondary index service. Uh, this is a different application I'm talking about, but this is a problem with read amplification. Because LevelDB does not use blooms for scans. Uh, maybe even, it might be true for HBase too, unless somebody changed things recently. Um, so blooms are not very useful when you do range scans. Uh, but uh, we needed to solve this problem somehow. And uh, the analogy that came, came to my mind at that time is that, well, um, it feels like, think about as if you are working like on a, uh, on a multi-story building and you are on a particular story of the building. Like, let's say you are working in New York and you're, your office is on the 19th floor. Very likely you go to meet people in the like 18th floor and 17th floor or something. You really don't go to the 100th or the 0th floor to interact with people because all the people you interact with are nearby. So we said that we want to go implement something called prefix scans. So we, saw, we looked at all our applications and all our applications that don't actually scan the whole database from beginning to end. Most of them do scans within short ranges of, of keys. So we said we are, going to introduce, we are going to implement something called prefix scans. So that means you can do scans only within the prefix of the key. Uh, you cannot do a global scan. And then we can set bloom filters for these prefixes so that when you do queries, you can very quickly eliminate files that don't have any keys with the prefix. So this actually helps like around 99% of our use cases because most of our use cases have like UIDs or timestamps or something like that as a prefix. Uh, of those keys. So this is an interesting technique to reduce write amplification for, uh, for, 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 uh, for our code. Uh, then yet another problem we saw is that um, read modify write. There are a lot of, there's yet another application that started to use our code. And then uh, it does for, for counters, like you need to update counters. And so every counter update, um, it like it takes the value of the counter and then adds one to it or adds something to it and puts it back. Or it's a or, or, or they want to store a list. So they read the value of the list and then they append an element to the list and write it back. So all those things, they need like 2x the number of IOPS because each is one read versus then some modification and then a write. Uh, so this is, this is a problem that we thought that uh, our code can solve better. Uh, anybody recognize the background of this picture? Yeah, this is Pittsburgh downtown. This is where I spent some time working on AFS at the time. And I used to spend a lot of time over here in Point State Park. So this is, there are two rivers merging here, right? This is the uh, Allegheny River, I think, and this is the Monongahela River and becomes Ohio River. But if you stand at the tip of the park, you can never say, you, you can never realize that there are actually two big rivers merging. It was really, really smooth. There's not like a single ripple out there. So we said that, hey, maybe for these kind of workloads, we could do something about making merges, being a, being a, a first class citizen of the database. So the database, LevelDB has like delete types and put types. 
So we introduced this concept of a merge record. This is a record that, that enables you to build uh, application level constructs into the database by not doing a read modify, right? So for example, if you want to do counter increments, we just, the merge record says that it is a plus plus operation. And then you need to specify your own application level background compaction to be able to merge these merge records into one put record. Uh, so this is, in my mind, is a very powerful uh, construct that we can, that applications can use to build many other higher level uh, constructs in a database. And instead of having keys and values, you could build, build keys and lists, or keys and hash maps, or keys and counters thing without doing a read modify write. So it uses only one IOP because if it, again, if your application is just writes, then this, this, is, this is highly beneficial. If your application has lots of reads and writes intermixed, then you might have to think about it to see how you'll do that. So at the end of this process, um, there are many other challenges we tried, um, uh, challenges we faced, which I kind of skipped. Uh, and we saw that for each of the challenges that we tried to solve, we saw that LevelDB has a very rigid design, which was causing us to not be able to solve each of these use cases. Uh, especially because LevelDB was made for a different use case in mind. For us, we are mostly worried about servers and, sto and fast storage. Um, so um, the rigidness is something that we said that we want to re-architect or redesign. And that's where our design is different. We want a pluggable architecture. We want applications to be able to uh, use our code on many different use cases rather than just one use case. So we, have, we wanted to make everything in the database very pluggable by the application. And so this is uh, what, um, or like the, the basic, the basic premise of what we had to change uh, in LevelDB. So LevelDB had log structured merge, gets, puts, scans, and forward and reverse iterations. And just to summarize of all the changes that we have made, we have made a lot of changes for each of these items and many, many more, which you, you would be able to see. Over, I can talk to you later about some of those. Uh, so this is where um, essentially like RocksDB is born. So um, RocksDB is like a persistent key value store, and it's an embedded database. Those are the two things we inherited from LevelDB. And it's, these are the things that we are focused on right now, how to make it work, work for fast storage. Uh, so RocksDB is not a distributed database. Again, it's a key value store, but it is not, it doesn't have any failover. It doesn't do any replication. It has, um, if, if you are, in, internally at Facebook, when we use RocksDB, we use our other mechanisms to replicate the data or to back up the data, but that is not part of the RocksDB code. So if you use the RocksDB code, you won't get those features for free. And the focus again is that, the reason is that I, we want to do less features here and make it more performant. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so, this is, so this is the RocksDB architecture uh, that is, uh, so it's very similar to the standard LSM architecture, but we have pluggable mem tables, so you can have your own mem table formats in memory. So what it means is that you could have different mem tables, one for, say, a flash storage, or one for RAM storage, because they will have different memory needs. For example, the mem tables for RAM database, you'd have to use a really good slab allocator like my previous speakers have mentioned. So that's very easily doable because you have pluggable mem tables. Then when a write request comes from the application, we do write to the mem tables and we do write to transaction log. Um, but the interesting thing is that uh, when these mem tables get flushed to the storage, now the storage format is also pluggable. So based on what you want to optimize for, whether you want to optimize for like read requests later or whether you want, want to optimize for how compact is your uh, data on disk, you could actually write your own pluggable disk format uh, to be able to store these files on disk. And even more interesting is that you could have your own pluggable compaction layer so that if you are doing merges of records or if you are uh, doing, say, TTLs of your database, like say you want your keys in your database to live for 30 days and automatically get removed. You could put all that logic in here, like pluggable compaction, similar to coprocessors in HBase maybe. Um, and then um, for gets and scan requests, we do use blooms all the time, even for gets as well as range scans, to be able to efficiently return results to the, to the, to, to the application. Um, so that is, uh, that is the very big picture of the architecture. I don't want to go into the details of the architecture discussion, but that is in our website, so you guys can maybe take a look at it. But I'll try to give you a, 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 um, an understanding of where I think we will be driving this product in the future. So one of them is to see, um, we are seeing machines which have more and more cores over time. I'm sure all of you guys have, are aware of that already. 
Um, but um, it's possible that with other types of hardware, you'll have, we'll have more and more CPUs per box. So we would like to see if we can make ROX DB scale. Um, linearly is kind of, a, kind of a tough challenge, I think, um, but at least we want to scale out. Uh, so even if you add more CPUs to your boxes, we should be able to make the database run that many times faster. Uh, so that's the, one of the goals of ROX DB. And the other goal um, is um, to be able to serve fast storage. So already, if you have one flash drive, you might be able to do, say, 60, 70,000 reads per second. And if you like stripe 10 of those flash drives, you get probably a million reads per second. Um, so there are lots of ways where the storage is becoming faster and faster and gives you more IOPS. So we would like to see if we can build something uh, which uh, build a software which doesn't become the bottleneck when the storage is really fast. Um, especially with like say RAM and NVRAM storage, you get like many millions of reads per second. So those are the two big uh, focus of RocksDB. Again, you'd see the focus is not on building, perform building features and the focus definitely is not like um, doing replication or um, failover or making it more distributed. It's a very single node uh, API. It's a C++ library that you can like link in with your application. Mm. And uh, so this code is uh, something that we have open sourced today. So as we speak, uh, our open source team has actually open sourced it. So you could be able to access all the code or the landing page in rocksdb.org. So it has pointers to our code base. It has pointers to some documents and our architecture guide. Um, and the, 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 the thinking behind this open sourcing is that uh, I think we'll be able to exchange ideas with you folks and maybe help you in some of your applications. Similarly, we'd like to get your ideas and see how you can uh, help us build, make RocksDB better. Thank you. Any questions?